So this is a think tank for our international society that studies microbiology. And it's made up of different focus areas like clinical infections and vaccines, applied microbiology, environmental microbiology. And the areas that I associate with, with most closely is host microbiology. And we tend to be three or four times a year, but the, really the focus of the host microbiology focus area has been trying to understand how we can foster interdisciplinary teams to study the problems that are facing the world today. And so specifically, HMB has pointed out things like immunology, neuroscience, engineering, artificial intelligence, uh, computational biology as groups that we want to engage with because I think I'll show as we go through the models that we're working with, we don't have the expertise to do this alone. The world is exceedingly complex and we need different teams with different specialties to better understand the world that we're living with and we're working in. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to start at a very broad overview talking about how we think about clinical infectious diseases, host pathogen interactions. We'll get some background information about the physiology of pregnancy and infections during pregnancy. And then I'm going to talk about some different models, including some cell culture models, uh, trans -well models, organ on a chip and animal models, and the pros and cons of each of those when we go to study them and try to draw conclusions from that work. So when host most of the time we're talking about humans meets a pathogen. There's a couple of different ways that we can understand that relationship. So one of the paradigms that's been around for a little over 20, 25 years is in the terms of host damage. So when a bacteria or some other microbe encounters a person or some other host, a few things can happen. One is that the host immune system could function normally and that host uh, basically prevents that pathogen from establishing colonization or some type of infection. And the result of that is there's no host damage or a change in homeostasis. The microbe could find a place to live within that host and not necessarily cause damage or a change and that host could become an asymptomatic carrier. So the microbe's there, but it's not necessarily doing anything to harm the host. Or the areas that we typically think of more commonly where you have an acute infection. You pick up a microbe, it makes you sick, your immune system ramps up, it clears that infection, and then you return to homeostasis. Or a chronic infection, where you may have up and down symptoms that wax or wane, but you're not able to clear that infection completely. So things like tuberculosis or syphilis are examples of chronic infection. And what I want to impress is that that host damage or that change in homeostasis sometimes is due to the bug, but sometimes it's due to our own immune system. And so COVID-19 was a great example of this. So COVID-19, we've just been, you know, through a few years of pandemic, is caused by the virus SARS-CoV-2. And it really ex it kind of exemplifies what host damage can look like from a physician standpoint. So typically, if somebody's exposed to SARS-CoV-2, they have this period where we're not able to detect infection yet if we're looking by PCR. And then a few days later, we see an increase in viral RNA being produced, mostly in the nose or in the uh, mouth. During that time where this virus RNA is increasing, most of the time patients have very minimal symptoms. So they might have a runny nose, a cough, maybe low-grade fever. These are not the people that are coming into the hospital sick. Wait a week or two, and people start to get better, and then they get much worse. And those are the people that were ending up in the hospital in large volumes, on the verge of being in a ventilator. And what we came to realize is there wasn't much viral replication going on at that point. It was actually mostly the immune system that had ramped up and kind of gone out of control. And this is really important for when I treat people, because if people come in during that first week, that's our time where we can use antivirals to try to prevent that second phase of illness. Once you get here, it's not the virus that's the problem anymore, it's the immune system. And so we shift from using things like antivirals to using things like steroids to blunt the immune system. Okay? And so this is a great example, host early on causing symptoms and a change in homeostasis, but then you progress to the point where it's really the immune system that's getting out of control and making people much more sick. So when a 
pathogen, and we use that term pathogen in quotes now because I think we have a better understanding that most of the time when we hit I mean, pathogens, there are very few obligate pathogens, meaning once they hit a human, they have to make that person sick. That when we understand the microbiome more, that we have a lot of opportunistic pathogens, bacteria that live with us that aren't necessarily causing a problem unless they get into the wrong setting, right? So when a host meets a pathogen, what determines whether a person gets sick? Well, there's a ton of host factors. A lot of them have to do with how robust the immune response they're going to have is, things like their age, their chronic medical conditions, do they have some genetic predisposition, what about their nutrition or diet. All of those things impact how well the host will put up a fight against that microbe. There's also behaviors or hygiene practices. I see a lot of people in the hospital with diabetic foot infections. Oftentimes if the patient would recognize that foot infection, clean the wound, keep it clean, that wound wouldn't progress, but most of the time they don't. There's a lot of pathogen factors. So a lot of these pathogens are well adapted through evolution to infect certain parts of the body, right? They have different adhesions to help uh, connect to or stick to different surfaces, toxins and ways to evade the immune system. The host range is important, right? We have some viruses that don't infect all mammals. We have the avian flu that occasionally jumps over and can infect humans. That's a host range issue. And then the reproductive capacity. You know, are they going to be able to get into a niche where they can replicate before the immune system clears them? And in the middle of that are those actual interaction points, right? So there are some bacteria that it takes very few bacteria to cause illness. Salmonella, Shigella, you eat a couple of those microbes as part of a meal, it's going to make you sick. They have a very low infectious dose, so it doesn't take many of them to get to the point where you're developing symptoms. But that plus the route of transmission or the route that the bacteria, the pathogen, comes in contact with the host makes a big difference on what that outcome is going to be. We're appreciating more about the microbiome and all the things it does to keep us healthy. And we'll talk about during pregnancy, it's changes in the microbiome that really open up avenues for infection. And then there's the host pathogen interactions themselves. If that pathogen comes in contact with certain cells, they're more likely to cause infections than other cells. So, I'm both a physician and a scientist. I spend about 25% of my time in the hospital seeing patients, and the rest of the time I spend in the lab. And so, it's, it's interesting to think about how I have to use my brain differently when I see a patient versus when I'm solving a problem in the lab. So most of the time when patients come to me in the hospital, they're presenting what we call signs and symptoms. So symptoms of what the patient complains of and signs of what I actually can see on their labs and on their exam. And so there's obviously some change that causes them to come in. I then have to work backwards from that. I have to ask them all these questions about, well, when did this start? Where have you been exposed to? What have you been doing? What's your life like? What other symptoms do you have that may be connected to this? What are your risk factors? And I have to then use almost like a pattern recognition with my knowledge of what normal homeostasis or processes in the body are supposed to look like to try to arrive at what the problem is. As scientists, we often start with the problem, right? Oh, this I know this bug causes infections in these patients. We're going to develop a reductionist model to try to think through that, we'll conduct experiments. We're going to come to some what we think are general conclusions, and then we're going to develop more complex models. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. But really, we're working in backwards um, from what happens when we see people in the hospital. So this is the clinical problem I'm going to pose today. So you have a woman who's pregnant. She's going to her prenatal visits. She's going through her pregnancy. She's excited. Everything is going well. She's measuring well. Her vital signs are, are looking good. And then all of a sudden, before 37 weeks, she gives birth to a baby who's not ready to be born yet, who was born prematurely or preterm. This baby then has to spend several weeks to sometimes months in the neonatal ICU because they're not ready to breathe, eat, or do all the functions that we need to be able to do when we're born. And so how do you get from here to here? And how common is that? So I'm going to talk about adverse pregnancy outcomes. And usually when I talk about that, I'm speaking specifically of neonatal sepsis. So 
an infection in the infant after they're born, or preterm birth or the process of being born early. So normal gestation pregnancy in humans is 40 weeks, so this is being born at least a month early, so 36 weeks or before. Worldwide, this is an epidemic that nobody talks about. There are 15 million cases annually. One million child die every year from being born prematurely. And this, so this is affecting over one in 10 births. Now, if you look at this map, this is an old map. This is from over a decade ago, but it's pretty much stands still you know, true today. If you look at where preterm births are happening, there's a large proportion in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's some in Asia, but you'll notice that the U.S. really stands alone in developed countries on where this happens, right? And not only does it happen if you don't care about the sheer numbers, we spend a lot of money on this as well. So let's zero in a little bit more to understand what's going on in the U.S. So this is from the March of Dimes. They're a not-for-profit organization that does a lot of work on pregnancy outcomes. This is from their 2022 report card. A couple things I want you to take away. One, the U.S. preterm birth rate over 10%. Again, over one in every 10 births is happening prematurely. They get a D-plus grade. And unfortunately, not only is this not getting better, it's actually kind of gotten worse over the couple of years of the pandemic. If you look within the U.S., it's also not homogeneous, right? So we have some states in the West and the Far East that have fairly decent preterm birth rates. But in the Midwest and the U.S. Southeast, the rates are sky high, upwards of 15% in Mississippi. Let's come in a little bit closer. Well, how are we doing in Kentucky? Not good, right? So we get an F grade, a preterm birth rate of 12%. Not only, again, are we not getting better, in the couple of years during the pandemic, this has gotten worse. Our infant mortality rate has gotten worse, and we still have severe problems with socioeconomic disparities with our pregnancy outcomes. So there are a lot of factors that go into this. We can talk about this at the end of the seminar if you want, but globally, not a great problem in the U.S., specifically bad. So why does it matter if you're born premature? So during development, there's a lot of things happening in utero, so during, you know, when the baby's still in mind. When that baby is born prematurely, unfortunately, there's no organ system in the body that's spared, right? So the infant can have nervous system problems, whether it's a hypoxic brain injury, changes in their eyes, which is retinopathy or prematurity, their lungs don't work well, we call that bronchopulmonary dysplasia, they have changes in their cardiovascular, their renal, their GI, and their immune system. And unfortunately, that's not something that they just outgrow. As they develop and get older, all of those early insults stay with them. So these kids, as they, if they survive their NICU stay, will be at increased risk for learning disabilities and mood disorders as an adult, chronic lung disease and asthma, cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, metabolic syndrome. So by not investing early on in the life to give these kids a healthy start, we are actually in some ways dooming them to a life of chronic health conditions. So we've talked about the scope, we've talked about the implications for the individual, what's the cause of this? So there's a large number of these preterm birth events that we don't understand. For some reason, the changes in homeostasis get broken down, inflammation starts and they deliver prematurely. Sometimes this initiates within the fetal membranes that we'll talk about in the next couple slides. But there's a fair amount of these that are resulting because of infection. So how does that work? So when we talk about infections during pregnancy, what we're often talking about is chorioamnionitis, or infection of the fetal membranes that surround the baby. So to orient everybody, this is the vaginal canal, here's the cervix, here's the uterus with the developing infant, the placenta is connecting the infant to the mom, and then around the baby you have these fetal membranes so basically containing the amniotic fluid. Now these membranes are complex. There are multiple different cell types that contribute and the innermost portion, so this is the side that faces the baby, we have the amniotic epithelium, we have these connective tissues, we have trophoblasts and fibroblasts and all of these different cell types and they're basically joined by 
this tissue here that is derived from the placenta and the baby with tissues that are derived from the mom. Okay? And so chorioamnionitis can either be a clinical diagnosis where mom comes in and she's having fevers, when her water breaks, you can tell that there's obvious infection there because it's purulent. Or it could be a histologic diagnosis where mom may not have any overt signs of infection, but when the baby's born, we can tell that baby is sick. And then they go back and look at the tissues under the microscope and they can see signs of infection. We think these infections usually originate in the vaginal canal. And we think they're often polymicrobial, meaning there's not just one, but there's usually more bacteria than one that are implicated in the infection. So while there's usually more than one bacteria at the site of the crime, uh, there are some players that are more likely. And the one we're going to focus on today is group B, Streptococcus or Streptococcus agalactiae. This is usually in the top three as far as causes of infections during pregnancy. So, Streptococcus agalactiae is an interesting bacteria. This is the primary one that we study in the lab. In healthy adults, I never see group B strep cause infections. Never. It's, it has a unique niche that it infects primarily during pregnancy, but we are seeing more GBS infection in those people who are either very old or have some type of metabolic abnormality. They have diabetes, they have obesity, or something else that raises their risk. So where do we find GBS normally? In the intestine, it lives there, it doesn't cause any problems, not a big deal. All of our data as far as colonization comes from late pregnancy, and so usually we're talking about rectovaginal colonization, so either within the rectum or in the vagina, and we know that if GBS colonizes those tissues in the mom, that's the major risk factor for ascending infection or infection during pregnancy. So, Again, 10 to 30% of the population is probably colonized. If we do nothing for those moms that are colonized, about 1 to 2% will give birth to a baby who's infected with group B strep. So a small piece of a fairly small pot. But because if you think about, one, how severe these infections are, and then two, how many women are pregnant, that pie adds up to a lot of people. And so the CDC actually recommends that all women at 35 to 37 weeks get screened for group B strep, and then if they're positive, they get antibiotics during labor. And we know that decreases the risk of the baby being born and developing sepsis from the first seven days of life. We also know there are problems with that because we're basically nuking the baby's microbiome off the start, and there's a lot of things that microbiome is important for. All right, so how do we think this works? So we think that GBS, probably because of some change in the vaginal microbiome, establishes a niche on the surface of the vaginal epithelium. Somehow, it then bypasses or gets around the cervical mucus plug. The data regarding how it does this, this is a non-modal bacteria, are really inconclusive. But then it basically will establish an infection here, in that tissue either between mom's tissue and that fetal membranes, and there, they're going to be identified by different receptors on these cells. We call them pathogen recognition receptors. These receptors will say, hey, there's a bacteria here. I need to signal for help. They start secreting all of these pro-inflammatory signals that we call chemokines and cytokines, things like tumor necrosis factor, interleukins. And basically, that calls the cavalry to come fight this infection. So that causes a bunch of neutrophils, which are our kind of first responders to bacterial infections to come in. And they basically then drop all of these proteases, which unfortunately will start to weaken the connective tissue, these collagens, in this layer that provides most of the tensile strength. And that inflammation also sets off uterine contractions. And so that leads to breakdown of these membranes and preterm birth. So if that system wasn't complex enough, I want to impress upon you about how complex maternal physiology is. So when a woman is pregnant, basically there's no system in the body that's not changed by that. So it's probably you know, not surprising that there's a bunch of hormonal changes associated with maintaining that pregnancy. But those hormones then work on the cardiovascular system to change cardiac output. 
They change things like respiratory rate and tidal volume in the lungs. Uh, the renal system gets different amounts of blood. We know there's changes in the female reproductive tract, but there's also changes systemically in the blood. So usually we actually see an increase in those neutrophils kind of floating around in the blood, but they don't seem to function as well. And because of that, Pregnant women are at increased risk for certain types of infections. So we saw during COVID, we see it with influenza. Those are infections that normally, this is a young, healthy population, would have no trouble with. But during pregnancy, they can develop severe infection. So not only throughout the body are all these signals being changed, in utero, in the reproductive tract, there's a lot of changes as well. In early pregnancy, you need inflammation in order for that blastocyst to implant in the uterine wall, to invade, to set up that placenta that becomes that life connection between mom and baby. After that happens, the body tones down that inflammation and develops this anti-inflammatory environment. And the reason it does that is because that baby developing inside is part dad, right? So it's almost like having an organ transplant. The body would otherwise go through and say, oh, this isn't me, this is foreign, I should attack it. We have to dampen that immune response in order to maintain the pregnancy so that the body basically doesn't abort the fetus itself. And then when it's time to deliver, then it's time to turn back on that inflammation to get those cells in, to break down the membranes to allow for normal labor to happen. So all of that's really complicated. The last complication is that I don't even know what a normal person is from a physiologic standpoint to some extent as a doctor. And that's because we have things like obesity and diabetes that are dramatically changing our population and our population itself. So what is diabetes? Diabetes basically results in you have higher than normal blood sugar levels. That either happens because you have not enough insulin production, this is type 1 diabetes, this is an autoimmune destruction of the cells that make insulin, or you make plenty of insulin but the body doesn't respond to it. So this is type 2 diabetes that usually goes along um, with obesity. Now in pregnancy we have a prelude to type 2 diabetes that sometimes we see that mom has normal blood sugar regulation except she becomes pregnant and all of a sudden her blood sugar spikes. That's usually a prelude that she's at high risk of developing type 2 diabetes later in life. There's a lot of different ways we can diagnose diabetes, but what I want to impress on you is that already if you look at the amount of the population that has diabetes, it's over 10%. If you look at the percent of the population that's got pre-diabetes or is at risk for diabetes, it's over a third, right? And so this is another complication on top of everything that's happened. So if you look over the last 20 years, you can see the diabetes epidemic started in the U.S. South Southeast, and then basically almost spread like a virus over the next 20 years throughout the rest of the U.S. There's basically nowhere in the U.S. that's spared. And if we look worldwide, it's probably not surprising those societies that have the highest rates of obesity also have the highest rates of diabetes, right? So we've gone up and down in our scope looking at individuals to society. It's hard for me when somebody comes in because again, pregnant women are usually a population that's otherwise healthy um, and can deal with some of these insults aside from the physiology that's changing inside them. And now you have diabetes and obesity on top of it, it makes things worse. So both diabetes and obesity carry their own risk factors, um, but during pregnancy those things again are amplified. Right? So mom, because the immune system doesn't work normally in the setting of those high blood sugar levels, a risk for bladder and other infections. Because inflammation is so tightly regulated during pregnancy, anything that tweaks that or alters that puts her at risk for preterm birth. Um, she's at risk for having a larger than normal baby. We call that macrosomia. They can be injured basically during the birth process. And the baby's at risk for things like heart defects, uh, other congenital abnormalities, but also developing obesity later in life. So, you know, this is one example of where we try to take some of the population demographics with what we're interested in. So this is a study from my lab a couple years ago where we basically asked the question, does having diabetes increase your risk for carrying GBS uh, late in pregnancy? And what you can see is there's been different studies 
that we found all the way back from the 80s to you know, the late 2010s. Uh, very different populations ranging from Inner Mongolia, China, uh, Pakistan to different U.S. populations. But what I want to highlight is when we looked at the frequency of those women who were GBS positive late in pregnancy, if you had diabetes, whether that's pregestational or gestational diabetes versus not, there's a lot of noise in this data, right? We have some populations that have carriage rates as high as 30%, or some that are as low as 4%. Now, this isn't a systematic review, but it does look like that there are several populations if you have diabetes that lowers your you know, immune system enough that you're going to be at higher risk for GBS colonization. All right, so I've talked for about 25 minutes. Any questions about the background before we start talking about some of the models we use to try to get at this from very simple to very complex? No? Yeah? I don't know if you talked about this, but is it possible that there is like an infection which, uh, which, is, which causes so much inflammation that you get early labor? Yes, so we, we absolutely know that's true. So anything that causes inflammation in the genital tract puts women at increased risk for preterm birth. So gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomonas, all of those sexually transmitted infections, we know that if that is left unchecked, those women are at much higher rates of preterm birth. If we treat those women, that risk goes down. So certainly anything that causes inflammation, because this inflammation during pregnancy is so tightly regulated, anything that tweaks that system puts the baby at risk for being preterm. I was going to ask, uh, as you had mentioned about diabetic patients being more susceptible, have you seen other groups such as like patients with factor V or polycystic ovary syndrome? That so the same situation? nobody's looked at that kind of so fine. Now the problem with things like diabetes and obesity is again they alter inflammation. So diabetes tends to dampen inflammatory response because there's so much glucose present, whereas in obesity, we have all this fat that generates actually some inflammation, so your inflammatory tone is different. So just like when you get a signal that say, hey, I need you to go do something, neutrophil, that signal still gets there, but the neutrophil is almost weary because it's getting those inflammation signals so often that they don't respond. So the downstream effect is very much that obesity and diabetes don't function normally from an immune system standpoint, but there's different mechanisms by the way they get there. Okay. Now, things like polycystic ovarian syndrome and some of the other ones you mentioned, you know, those inflammation isn't the key driver, but I could see something like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, where inflammation that isn't well controlled, those women have more difficulties during their pregnancy. Okay. So. That was actually my question. Okay. Cool. All right, let's push ahead. So we're going to talk about some of these different models that we have to study um, these different host pathogen interactions. So we're going to start really basic. Vaginal colonization, right? We have bacteria, we have a vaginal epithelial cell. You know, this should be easy to model. We just put them together and we figure out what's going on, right? So the traditional cell culture model is that we basically grow cells in culture. Usually that's, we have like some type of plastic dish. We have this growth media that has all the nutrients the cells need to grow. And then we just throw our pathogen in there and see what happens. And so these are uh, an immortalized epithelial cell line called VK2 cells. You can grow them and they make this really nice epithelial appearance. They've got this nice cobblestone appearance. You can see there's no you know, break in the cells. They're all connected to each other. They're happy. And we can throw in more glucose here because that's one of the uh, things that we're interested in with diabetes. But when we go to infect with group B strep, you can't leave these cells very long or basically the group B strep kills them. Right? So you can see here all of these cells in the bottom are basically pulling away. Here they're lifting off. They're covered with group B strep. Group B strep has killed all the cells. We can't really look at interactions. We can't keep the cells along long enough to actually have those interactions. And so while that traditional culture method is easy, it lacks a lot to be desired. And so 
Um, we started, we came across this model and have been using this in the lab. So basically we're still using those same epithelial cells, but we grow them at this air liquid interface. So what we have here is basically a plastic construct, we call it a transwell, but there's a semi-permeable membrane here. So you can put media in and all those nutrients will diffuse from the bottom and basically after a couple of days there's enough cells here that will restrict that media from kind of leaking through the pores of the membrane. And so there's air on top, nutrients from the bottom. So at least conceptually, this looks more like an epithelium would, right? So if you think about your skin, it's connected to the outside world, all that nutrition, all those nutrients are coming from the blood supply from below. This models that a little bit better. If we look at this under microscopy, we no longer have just that single layer of cells. We have multiple layers that kind of build up. Um, and that basically allows us, when we infect these cells, so here is infected with group B strep and then we stained with a GBS lysate antibody to show where the strep was. You can see the, all the bacteria on the surface and these cells are at least able to stand up to that infection longer than that couple of hours for the monoculture. And so some of the initial experiments that we were doing at Vanderbilt was again, we grow these cells to the point they're confluent and then we were basically exposing some to normal media or some with media that we've supplemented with extra glucose, again, trying to model what we think might be happening in diabetes, and then we basically infect with group B strep and look at different readouts. And so we do a lot of scanning electron microscopy in my lab, and so we look at uninfected cells at increasing concentrations of glucose. So this is um, five and a half is about 90 to 100. So when we think about patients with diabetes, normal blood sugar, depending on what you've just eaten, is anywhere between like 60 and 100. 10 millimolar glucose is up into like 180, so a patient with well-controlled diabetes is usually in the 120 to 180, 200 range. And then over 200, we start worrying more about how well they're controlling their diabetes. So this is 270 milligrams per deciliter and 360 milligrams per deciliter. Once people get above four or 500, that's usually at the point where they're having to come into the hospital because they're getting other metabolic derangements. So if we then infected with a couple different strains of GBS, so strains are kind of like people, we're both people, but we're genetically distinct, they have difference in virulence factors and different in some characteristics. You can see as we increase the amount of glucose that these cells are exposed to, and again, all of this nutrition is coming from the bottom of that well, these bacteria are not in any direct contact with the cell culture media. You see the change in growth where we get this big kind of shag carpet appearance. So this is a biofilm. This is basically chocked full with those bacterial cells. Now, this is a different bacteria. We still see an increase in the number of bacteria that are there, but it's not to the same extent as with this strain. If we then look to see the inflammation signals these cells are, are putting out, what was really interesting is that as we increase the amount of glucose going from red to yellow to green to blue in this uh, figure, as we increase the amount of glucose these cells were exposed to, the amount of that inflammation signal that they set out, that help signal, actually decreased. Right? So they were secreting the most IL-6, GM, CSF, IL-8, those pro-inflammatory cytokines at normal media conditions, but less the more glucose they were exposed to. And then uh, in contrast to that, this anti-inflammatory IL-1 receptor antagonist, so this is an, a cytokine that basically shuts down inflammation, shuts down uh, the inflammasome, um, showed an increase. And then when we look at other uh, mediators, these cells make very little. So the combination of the bacteria changing to a biofilm growth phase, the decrease in inflammation, both would generally, uh, I would presume, increase our likelihood that that bacteria is going to be able to remain on that vaginal mucosa um, and stick around. So using this model, um, after I came to U of L about a year ago, uh, I met Herman Fribos and you know, what they were really looking to do is provide a probiotic delivery mechanism. And so they were working on these nanofibers that they could then use to deliver lactobacillus. We haven't talked about the microbiota in vagina. Uh, generally, lactobacillus crispatus is thought to be the good microbe that helps prevent a lot of other microbes from establishing themselves. 
And so typically when you have bacterial vaginosis or some other infection, one of the things that we would hope to be able to do is encourage that lactobacillus, that good bacteria, to kind of come back. And so using this delivery mechanism where you have these lactobacillus cells that you can basically decorate these fibers, the question is, well, is, would this be a way where we could deliver a probiotic or a good bacteria back into the setting? So again, we're going to use our model. And basically what we'll do is either use nanofibers that don't have bacteria, nanofibers that look like these sheets with bacteria, and then we're going to basically see what happens as far as the bacteria, um, the lactobacillus themselves, but also when we add group B strep into the system. So one of the things that I would typically expect lactobacillus to do is to generate lactate, which then would change, or lactic acid, which would change the pH, right? So our cell culture media at baseline is 7.4, it's buffered. Um, but that's all in the bottom of these wells. So one of the things we did is starting off is we left either untreated, um, which has got PBS with 7.4 pH, nanofiber treated or the lactobacillus nanofiber treated. And you can see at 24 hours of growth, we get this pretty good drop in pH. Now, as we go on over the next couple of days, we lose that extent. Normal vaginal secretions are in the four to five range. So what's going on? Why doesn't that pH keep dropping? Well, I think this is a limitation of this model is basically you trap all that acid in a very small space. There's no flow, there's no secretion. And it basically starts to weaken some of that tight junctions from cell to cell. And I think we're getting some of that media coming up from the bottom that's buffered that's causing this to increase. Now, we don't see any big change with GBS. Uh, GBS has metabolism, but I wouldn't expect it to drop the pH as much as the lactobacillus would. What about when we add GBS into the system? So we gave the lactobacillus and the nanofibers 24 hours head start, and then we added GBS in there. And you can see we got a little bit of variability in the few times that we've done this. But um, with our nanofibers, we had one run where we actually had an increase in GBS, and the rest or maybe decrease to unchanged. But when we add the lactobacillus nanofibers in, we seem to be getting a decrease in the number of GBS, our bacteria of interest that we're recovering. And so the way we do this is we take out sample, we plate it on uh, a cell culture plate, and so you can see this is the run where the fibers actually had more GBS compared to our lactobacillus or our PBS control. What do the surface look like in these infections? So at 24 hours, if we look at low power, we can see stuff on the surface. We start zooming in up to uh, 2500X. You can see these really nice lactobacillus bacteria on the surface, these rod-shaped cells. As we move up in time, I hope you can appreciate that that growth seems to be increasing. Again, these are all chock full with those lactobacillus cells. And then at 72 hours, there's even more of them. So you get that kind of nice bacterial biofilm. Lactobacillus usually only grows when you have lower oxygen tension, but there's something going on between the cells communicating with the lactobacillus that even though I'm growing these in a regular CO2 5% incubator, they're seeming to grow without any issues. What about GBS? Well, certainly we've shown this before. We can get all of these biofilm structures or GBS on the surface when we untreat it. It's interesting, when we add the nanofibers, I don't know if it's the pH or something else, we get these long chains all of a sudden. So GBS is still responding to something that's changing how it's growing. But when we add the lactobacillus nanofibers, we actually can see the lactobacillus here with these chains of group B strep. So group B strep at high power looks like these little hamburgers that are in a chain, and the lactobacillus looks like these rods. So they're right together. And what they're doing and how they're communicating, we don't fully understand yet. But at least the model gives us an opportunity to study that in context. All right, so the vaginal epithelial model, pros and cons. So pros, it certainly gives us a better exposure uh, than traditional monoculture. We can do longer infections and get better cytokine responses. The limitations, these are still immortalized cell lines. They're not primary cells. They still have some deficiencies. There's no flow, so we do have some buildup of metabolites that whenever we go in there and change the media completely, you're going to get an artificial kind of shift in what's actually there. 
And then it's hard to model a true microbiome in this model because a lot of these bacteria need different conditions than what your cell culture needs, right? Because most of the time when you make that microaerophilic condition in the body, it's a very small subset on the surface of the epithelial cell, whereas the rest of the mucosa has a very different oxygen tension. All right, let's move forward. So that was modeling colonization. What about the fetal membranes themselves? So again, these fetal membranes are complex tissues. Here's the amniotic epithelium. We get these connective tissue with the fibroblast. And then you have the maternally derived tissues that have all different cell types, like these decidual stroma cells, trophoblasts, macrophages, uh, T cells, and other lymphocytes. So when I was at Vanderbilt, my boss had this dream of building a uh, instrumented fetal membrane on a chip, we call it an IFMOC, where basically we'd be able to have a device with multiple chambers that we could see each chamber with a certain cell type, and then you'd have this semi-permeable membrane separating them. And then using microfluidics, you could basically measure the input and output of things like your metabolism, your glucose consumption, your inflammation. We got into a two-chair, a two-tiered, or two-chamber device, um, but logistically, with all of the microfluidics, the pumps, and everything, it became very technically complex. So uh, some of my collaborators at Vanderbilt, Dr. Allison Eastman, Brian O'Grady, and uh, Dave, Dan Cliffel, are still working on different models. So this is our third generation instrumented fetal membrane on a chip. So this is a 3D printed model um, that's basically PDMS and then they mount it onto a slide. And basically the goal is right now, this is two chambers. You have a fetal side with one cell type, you have a maternal side with another cell type, and then you have this kind of gelatin, hydrogel layer in between that you'd be able, the cells may potentially be able to get through that hydrogel layer. And so this is what it actually looks like. You can see the scale, you can see the microfluoridic pores, and then from microscopy you can see kind of the pillars here separated and then filled with that hydrogel. Uh, this is still very much a work in progress, but the idea was then to connect that to something downstream that we could measure in real time. So this is something that the Cliffle Lab has been working on, where they have basically this eight-channel sensor to look at the things that we're interested in. So they already have sensors for things like metabolism, glucose, lactate, acetylcholine, and they're working on developing things that can measure inflammation, things like IL-8, or these proteases that would otherwise break down some of those collagens. Um, and so work in progress. The benefit of something like this is you have flow. You can continue to grow the, um, those cells because you're giving them a continuous influx, just like blood would be delivering uh, nutrients in the body. Uh, but there's also, you know, you can see all these wires, all the pumps that you have to go in an incubator. It gets very technically complex very quickly. Why don't we just use the real thing, right? So we actually have a human fetal membrane model. So this is tissue that we get from women undergoing routine C-section. Um, so ideally these are non-laboring. They haven't had the inflammation going. These women are getting C-sections for other reasons aside uh, from infection or inflammation. And so basically what we do is this is a, you know, we trim off the membranes from the placenta after the baby's born, and we can take them back into the lab, and we can mount them on these plastic structures, and that allows us to directionally infect the way that the bacteria would hit the tissues in the body. So the pros are you've got all the right cells in the right configuration. The cons are that these tissues are only viable for a short period of time. We are lacking all of those systemic signals that would normally be going on in mom, right? What I have is what I got. I can't have neutrophils from the blood coming into these tissues to fight infection because they're no longer connected to mom. The other problem that we run into is a lot of our normal cell culture media is very nutrient rich. They want to encourage whatever you're growing to grow. And so there's an excess of nutrients there in a way that is not present in the body. So this normal media we use is called DMEM. It's got two grams per liter, so it's already a very nutrient-rich media, so it makes it hard other than going back to the drawing board and basically devising new cell culture medias to really model what we're hoping the environment actually models. And then I will say availability being limited is also a thing, so the politics around this issue is getting worse. None of these tissues are from aborted 
tissues. These are from babies that are born healthy. If the baby was not healthy, the tissues would go to the pathology lab to be studied. Um, but because this has fetally derived tissue, there are some states that are outlawing that, um, mostly because they're worried about aborted tissues, but this is still fetally derived tissue. Well, let's take this one more step in complexity. Let's talk about animal models of infection. So um, we're not doing this currently, but we do have an animal model of pregnancy infection where we basically have a mouse that uh, we mate, she becomes pregnant, and we can give an intravaginal inoculation with GBS. And we can see where that GBS goes inside those tissues. We can look in the vagina, the uterus, the decidua, the placenta, the amnion, and all the way to the fetus. And what we were looking at for this paper was a parent strain, a strain lacking a zinc efflux pump, and then a complemented mutant that has that efflux pump given back. And you can see in this example that those um, mice that had the um, mutant did not get as sick. We can look at the tissues and stain with that GBS antibody. And you can actually see where the tissues are being infected, and in the mutant they were not infected in that experiment. So what are the pros? Well, this certainly can give us a glimpse of the systemic changes in context, right? Moms, what's going on systemically in mom, I mean throughout her body, can be transmitted to that local infection. Mice are relatively inexpensive. We can look at genetic backgrounds, so we can knock out certain genes in the mouse and look at how that, from an immune standpoint, changes the outcome of that infection. But there's also drawbacks. Mice are not men. Um, it's something that comes up every time a paper is reviewed. We know it's the case, but it's the best that we have. There are shorter gestation periods. That's great for the lab, but how well does that really model the 40 weeks of human gestation? The uterus and placenta structure in the mice is different, and so is the timing and how they develop. So how good is infecting that and drawing conclusions about how this would happen in a person? And for a lot of our infectious agents who are interested in people, mice are not their natural host, right? So we're giving them artificially in a way that the mice don't get colonized with GBS unless we give it to them normally. Mice do not have a lactobacillus dominant vaginal flora normally. So there is still some degree of artificial nature to these infections. All right, so to kind of bring everything home, what do I hope everybody kind of takes away from this discussion? Host pathogen interactions in the real world are really, really complex. And I can say that both as a physician taking care of the people and the things that we talk about, as well as the scientists trying to model that in the lab. There are a lot of different ways to model these infections. Some are very simple, some are extremely complex. They all have limitations. And so when I'm reviewing papers, when I'm you know, reviewing things and thinking about stuff in our own lab, one of the things that comes up is, are we actually modeling what we think we're modeling? How generalizable are our conclusions? Because that's a big issue in today's science. We know there's a lot of things being published. A lot of it is not reproducible. And probably it has to do with those conclusions we draw based on very simple models when life is not nearly that simple. And then the other thing is that microbiology as a field needs and wants interactions of multidisciplinary teams. So if I can do nothing other than, you know, plant a seed of excitement or, or inquisitiveness that microbiology needs other people who have other expertise other than us because again, these models get very complicated, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's biomedical engineering, whether it's computational biology, that's gonna be the way in the future to really meet the complexity of the real world. And we're just not there yet, but we're trying to get there. All right. And with that, I want to acknowledge some people that have been in my lab. So a lot of this work I've shown that was done by uh, Joel Omage, who was a research assistant while I was at Vanderbilt. Uh, since I've come to U of L, Nagra Baz is um, a postdoc in the lab, and Chris Farrell is a graduate student that just joined. Uh, we have collaborators from Vanderbilt. This is Allison Eastman. Uh, she's the one that's working on the instrument and field membrane on the chip. Uh, David Aronoff is now at Indiana University. And then uh, our collaborators in the Freebos lab working on trying to think through how we can deliver good bacteria back into these systems 
and I'll thank my funding, and with that, I'm happy to have some discussions about the complexity of models or anything else that you have questions about. So there, there are changes throughout pregnancy, um, and that some of those changes probably then open up the door for bacteria like GBS. Some of that's hormonal, um, some of that is changes in vaginal secretions that happen throughout. And when I say that the normal woman lactobacillus is the healthy bug, that's an oversimplification. We know that there are certain groups of bacteria that kind of go together. And we know that, again, the more lactobacillus crispatus dominant you are, that tends to be a more protective or what we think of as a healthier microbiome. But there's other lactobacillus species. There's lactobacillus innards, which it's related species, but seems to not function the same. And so that actually is a one that predisposes to more disruption in the microbiome. So the hard part is, you know, we've only been really understanding the microbiome and its complexities for the last 15 years. And our ability to repopulate a good microbiome is very much still in development. And how we deliver that is still also in development. So C. diff, which is an infection in the intestine, usually happens after you get antibiotics and you kill off the good bacteria. We've gone through all sorts of mechanisms. and. Replacing good bacteria actually is probably the best treatment we have for C. diff. The problem is how we do that. So five years ago, I had somebody in C. diff and I wanted to give them a fecal microbiota transplant. Basically, I would have to send them to the GI doctor. The GI doctor would find a healthy person that they were related to. That healthy person would bring in a stool sample, they would put it in a blender, and then they'd use a colonoscopy to instill those good bacteria. We now have some pill formulations. We have formulations you can put down somebody's nose using a tube, but it's not always easy to get the good bacteria where we want or when we want it. And we know if we don't use the right bacteria, then we can actually make people more obese by giving them the wrong microbiome in the intestinal tract and put them at risk for other infections and some autoimmune conditions. So it's, it's really, really complicated. That was a much bigger answer than you gave it yet. So I, I was curious, are there cases of preterm liver that are not bacteria? Yeah, there, there's certainly some that we don't have a clear answer for, right? There are some of the bacteria that cause these infections that we can't grow very well in the lab, which makes it hard to identify them. But there are certainly women who have other causes of inflammation like preeclampsia that put them at risk for preterm birth too. So there are sterile inflammations that can lead to preterm birth, just like there are non-sterile or infectious inflammation. So um, those are the cases that are even harder because it's really hard to figure out what's the igniting factor into that inflammation burn that, that causes those changes. Yeah. Um, do you see some similar effects, um, what you see with, like, say, diabetes, um, in other things that uh, uh, cause immune suppression, sort of, so like, you know, post transplant or, you know, whatever? And, and I guess, do you see cross applications for some of this work to help in those cases? So there certainly are, you know. The question is, why is, are you immunosuppressed? There's all sorts of mechanisms to get there. Like I said, inflammation or obesity causes low-grade inflammation, so you don't respond to the signals. The hyperglycemia and diabetes changes how certain cells function. Certainly, we have all sorts of different chemotherapies and medications that act on different parts of the immune system in different ways. Pregnancy is probably the most unique experience because I am very immunosuppressed here in utero, but the rest is systemic, it's kind of this mixed bag. But there's certainly, I think, common pathways to be found that we could hopefully exploit in the future to better understand that, whether it's you know someone with rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, they get medicines, 
um, you know, because because those are common risk factors that make people at risk for infections that we otherwise wouldn't see in that same person. Anything else? All right. Thank you, everyone.